Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love that song. You can't get to saying the name of Jesus and his name's powerful. His name is all we need. And whew, it begins to stir something in your spirit, man. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to be back. Pastor Diane and I took a little weekend away and, and uh, enjoyed it. So it's good to be back home. We love you all. Missed you. Uh, I want to speak to you for a few moments this morning about it's the midnight hour. It's the midnight hour. If there's ever a time that we're living in, it's definitely now, the midnight hour. I believe that God's time clock is winding up. Things are coming to a close. I believe that the rapture of the church could happen at any moment, even before we get out of here this service, and uh, for things to take place so that God's second coming can happen and set up his kingdom, his rule, and his reign forever and ever more. Uh, but if you would, just go to chapter Luke uh, chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, and I want to start off with the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's instructing people how to pray. And as we go through this, we're going to find some things that are nuggets. And, and some of the stuff I have talked about before, but I just God has been dealing with me all this week on this. It's the midnight hour. How many knows we live in perilous times? We live in times of uncertainty. Uh, there's such a divide in our country. There's a divide in families uh, uh, politically. And it should never be. Your loyalty and your allegiance should be to the kingdom of God first. First and foremost, you're a Christian first. And uh, the church has sit back and has been passive in the past. Uh, I think largely to do with the, uh, the 501c3 uh, nonprofit status that we've had that, that uh, President Johnson came into uh, an agreement with with the Christian community to get them to shut up because they were uh, talking about how bad of a, a deal was going on and how his presidency was uh, was not really all that great and so he gave him said hey we'll, we'll help you out and fix you up and let you be a nonprofit and don't pay taxes and all that and the church bid into it and uh, so but you can't say anything from the pulpit you can't be political and you can't uh, you know, just speak your mind and, and push a certain candidate and all that. And the church entered into that agreement, and I don't believe that the Lord wanted us to enter into that agreement. And then President Trump has come along and took care of all that, and we can say what we want. Amen? I said, we can say what we want. And I'll even go you one step further. If they was to come in and say, we're pulling your nonprofit status, I believe that if you stand and speak the truth in common sense, and in love, now, don't do something stupid and get way out there, that God will honor that and He will bless that. And if, if they take your nonprofit status, let them take it. God will meet the need of His house, of His church, and of His kingdom. And it's coming a day that we've got to stand up and take a stand for righteousness. We've got to take a stand for holiness. It, it, there's no longer, the blurred lines are no longer blurred. It's either you're this way or you're that way. And it's, and it's got real popular to paint people into corners now, to label them this or to label them that. And, and I, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I stand for what the Word of God stands for. If it, if it doesn't uh, stand for that, then I'm not standing for it. It's the final authority. It's been inspired by the Holy Spirit to move upon natural men to spin the word so that you and I could have a guidebook, if you will, or a life book or a life preserver so that we could finish out our days, walk in victory, walk in glory, walk in the power and the authority that Jesus Christ commissioned us to do. And so as far as Pastor Dine and I, we're taking a bold stand. We're calling black, black, white, white, wrong, wrong, right, right. There's no in-between. We're going to be very vocal from the pulpit of what God is wanting to say in this last day. No longer wishy-washy stuff. No longer afraid to step on toes. And you say, well, 
aren't you afraid that you may run some off? Well, never want to run anybody off. I want everybody to come in. But if it's something come from the pulpit that's the truth and the Word of God, just because it goes against your political persuasion, if that runs you off, then we didn't need you anyway. Amen? And God will send in people that will support and love. Amen? Don't want to run nobody off. Ain't going to intentionally try to do that. But we're going to speak the truth. All right. Luke chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. We're going to start off. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And by the way, don't you like this new lower third? Isn't that awesome? Amen. That's great. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 3. Give us our daily bread. Remember those words, daily bread. Now let's jump on down to verse 5. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at the midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on this journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut. And my children are in my, and me are in bed. I cannot rise and give to you what you need. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is uh, his friend, yet because of his persistence. Everybody say persistence. Now everybody say persistence. Okay. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. What I want to share with you just for the next few moments is it's midnight. It's time that we get busy. It's time that we start pounding on doors. It's time that we start uh, rattling things and making, making it known that we are in the midnight hour. Jesus Christ is on the cusp of, of the rapture and of his second coming. And it's time for us to be about the Father's business. In the first few verses there, it's a, it's, a, it's a one-on-one. Give us, or give me, give me my daily bread. See, back in the biblical days, a loaf of bread was enough for one person for a day. But now this person's come along and says, I need three loaves because I've got some unexpected visitors unexpected get, uh, guests coming in and I don't have anything prepared for them and I want to be prepared I want to have something so that when they come to my house I will be able to feed them this is a picture of the church I believe today that for all for such a long long time we come to church to just to get my blessing come to church to get my fix or my feel or my need met and all I need is that one loaf just give me my loaf when I come in because I'm hungry and that's good and that's okay and that's what church is all about but also too it's to come in and get filled up and overflowing so that when we run into other people that comes in our sphere of influence or comes into our uh, home we have something to give them And when I speak of home, I'm not so much talking about our physical house. I'm talking about our spiritual house. I'm talking about our church. I don't want to be a church that when when somebody comes in, guests come in and visitors come in, that we don't have anything for them. We're just in a dry, dead form. One, two, three. Uh, Here we go. Let's go home. That's not giving anybody anything. I, I, I actually like to see it like this. The people show up early to get on the front row, amen, and they say, I'm going to get on the front row because there's too many distractions in, in sitting in the back. I see too many people doing this, and I want on the front so I'm not distracted because I need more than just one loaf. I need three loaves for what getting, God's getting ready to do because I'm going to go to work. To tomorrow, and I'm going to be involved in an uh, uh, either an office atmosphere, or a shop atmosphere, or, or a retail atmosphere, and I want to have something to give out so that when the Holy Spirit prompts me, and the Holy Spirit leads somebody into my into my uh, sphere of influence, I've got something to give them. I just didn't go because 
look, look, and I, I mean this with all love and, and, and warmth and as best as Pastor Jim can do in my black and white personality, we've got to stop coming to church getting just enough so that we stay saved for the next week. There's a type, the, the messages that we preach, the Wednesday nights that we do, is all about moving and grooming and growing and in, uh, informing you and imparting into you the Word of God, the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God so that you start to grow and mature and we don't, are not spiritual babies all of our lives. We've got to grow, we've got to mature, and we as the American church, we as the ministers and the clergies, have got to start putting out word that will feed people, that will uh, challenge them and encourage them to grow and go, and so that they're not just coming in and coming to church to barely stay saved. We've got to move past that. There's enough media, there's enough word that goes forth that we ought to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. He never calls us to be strong on our own might. He never calls us to do anything in our own strength, but it's His strength, His power, His might, His calling, His anointing that empowers us to go and do. So we've got to move past uh, what the American church has been for so long of just coming and getting our little fix and and, and barely staying saved and struggling all week long and uh, letting it and I, I'm not saying we don't never go through things we do but there's times we got we just got to go through them we got to breeze through them you got to go through them we live in the last days the closing moments before Jesus Christ comes back for his church I believe that we're in the midnight hour you know in Matthew chapter 25 it talks about the, uh, the virgins that was waiting on the bridegroom. We all know that five were foolish and five were wise. Five had enough oil to, to do them all through the day and all through the night so that when the bridegroom came knocking, they were ready. Five didn't. I think this is a great picture of the church today. There's people in the church that are filled up got their lamps all trimmed and burning, they're full of oil, they're full of the anointing, they're full of the Holy Ghost, they're full of fire, they're full of energy, Holy Ghost energy, and, and, and no matter when that bridegroom may knock, say, go witness, or here I come, or you need a healing, or whatever, they're, 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 their lamps are full, they've got something there to, to sustain them, they've got something there, they've got more than just one loaf, they've got three loaves. And then there was the five foolish that just, that just barely just get enough to keep them going. Barely just stay, just save just enough to keep your conscience okay. But God's calling us to be wise, to be full, to overflowing. See, you'll never give out what you don't have excess of. What you get in excess, well, you will give out. It will slosh out on others. That's why you need to be full of the Holy Ghost every day. That's why you need to pray in your spiritual language uh, called speaking in tongues every day. You need to pray in that. Why? Because you're filling your Holy Ghost tank back up. Because it's easy to get depleted in today's society. You don't have to real, be a Bible scholar to, to know that it's midnight politically, midnight economically even though that we are doing pretty good here in the states don't be don't be deceived by that i love the things that's going on right now i love the low unemployment i love i love all the low numbers that are historic that than we've ever known here in the united states that's great and that's good but let's don't get lulled to sleep by that because there's something underlying there's something underlying that's going on that wants to tear all that down that wants to tear all that down. That one day there will be a one world currency. One day there will be a one world government. One day. But not until Jesus Christ allows it. Here's the hope and the promise that we have. He is in control. Bar none. He allows to happen what happens. And he doesn't allow to happen what he don't want to happen. He is ultimately in control. It's his time clock. He's on, a, he's on a set 
clock and he's allowing it to go and to, but again we still there's something underlying and what happens to us in America and, I, and I'm a I'm a patriotic dude don't you run down America to me don't you say that you want socialism because I'll, I'll buy you a ticket to Venezuela uh, you know I mean I, I, I will get you there socialism is not of God it's an antichrist spirit and, and, and this younger generation, it's, it drives me crazy. Socialism. Who, I mean, who wants that? We're living in the midnight hour politically. Everything free. I know I'm getting on, get, going to get on a soapbox. Everything free. Ain't nothing free. Nothing's free. Amen? We're headed to all that. We're headed to a nuclear holocaust. You know, there's a group of, uh, there's a group of scientists that meet in Chicago every year. And they meet and they have a, a uh, nuclear clock, a time clock they call it. Now these scientists that get together are not Christians, they're not born-again believers. There are a lot of them that's agnostic and atheists. They don't believe in the things of God. But they know the times and they see all what is going on. And they just met, a, 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 I think it was last year or so, and moved the hands from nine minutes till midnight to four minutes till midnight. Now this is in their perception and this understanding of all the stuff that goes on about nuclear powers and all these uh, rogue regimes that's got the nuclear powers. So they, they settled on four minutes to midnight, but there was a vigorous debate to set the minute hand to one minute to midnight. All, not quite the majority, they wanted to set it to one minute to midnight, but they finally settled, settled on four minutes. So what's that got to do with us? I'm saying even the unrighteous, unbelieving people know that things are winding up. Time is getting close. There is a famine in the body of Christ. There's a real need for revival and an outpouring of God's Spirit to begin to turn our hearts back to God. Time is getting faster. If you traveled in Jesus' day, you either rode donkey, camel, or horseback. But today, you can hop on a plane and, and uh, you, how many remembers the Concorde? Uh, they took it out of, out of service, but you could fly from New York to Paris in three hours and 15 minutes on the Concorde. It's a big supersonic jet. That's how fast time can travel. Now, we don't even need a plane. We can facebook somebody we can skype somebody in real time anywhere in the world we're live streaming this morning on facebook we're live streaming on our website amen getting it out i just looked over and seen one thing and guy says hey i'm watching from atlanta hello atlanta amen good to have you so it's time, time. We need, we need three loaves, not just one loaf, not just for ourselves. The midnight hour is coming, and Jesus is saying the position of the church is to be one of beating on the door. The reason this gentleman in this scripture got three loaves is because he was persistent. He was beating on the door. He was beating on the door. Even though he got turned away and turned down and said, go away, me and my children are already in bed, we're already cleaned up, we're, everything's put away, I don't have anything out, he began, he just kept beating, he kept beating, kept beating. There's something to be said for persistence. There's something to be said for, for getting a hold of something and not letting go of it and just pray. I believe that we ought, uh, it, to me, that's a, th to me this is, almost a shadow of intercessory prayer he got into prayer and he didn't give up he began to pray 
He began, and even though he didn't see it, he kept praying. Even though the guy didn't come to the door and answer, he kept beating. Even though you're praying and you don't see it, you keep praying. Remember, faith acts like it's so, even though it's not so, so it can become so. Amen? That's what Michelle's doing up here. Faith's acting like it's so, even though she's not totally got all of her healing yet, but she's doing it so it can become so. In other words, she's, she's beating on the door. She's beating on the door. One loaf is, she's okay, and she, can I use you, Michelle? One loaf says that Michelle's okay to a degree, and she can come to church and sit in the seat and just have a, and be in a good weekend service. That's one loaf. Three loaf says, I'm not settling for that. I'm settling for getting back into my place and my position where I was before I had the stroke, and now I'm beating on the door. I'm beating on the door. I need three loaves. I need my voice back. I need my mobility back because I have a calling and a purpose on my life. That's beating on the door. That's beating on the door. Roxy, you've been beating on the door. You've been beating on the door. No more one loaf, but three loaves. Amen? Beating on the door. How many's been beating on the door? How many's been praying and interceding for God to do something and you feel like you're just beating on the door and beating on the door? Sometimes you don't feel like you've went past from hitting with your fist to hitting with your head. Beating on the door. God says it's three loaf time. It's three loaf time. Hallelujah. Three loaf time. In verse 3 of this scripture that I read, it says, Give us day by day our daily bread. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of daily bread. I want a Holy Ghost deluge. I want an outpouring. I, I, I long for the day that the church comes in and, and we don't have to cheerlead and, and whether the, the, our, our worship team always does great always does great but there's those times when it's extra special man and it's just like it's just like a wave that hits you and then everybody gets in i long for the day that when when the the, the worship team's just having an average day okay don't don't kill me kim just having an average day that it doesn't affect you how you worship amen i i love feeling the the goosebumps and the and the shumi numis as good as anybody I love that, but that doesn't hinge on my worship. That doesn't hinge on my beating on the door. They may be having an off Sunday, but I'm going to have an on Sunday. Amen? Hallelujah. Beat on the door. Hallelujah. See, we need to graduate from give me my daily bread. Give me just enough to keep me saved, Lord. You know what that does? That keeps you on the defense. If Satan can't make you go out here and totally black backslide and quit on Jesus, he will so attack you and keep you bombarded and keep you so suppressed down and contained that all you can do is just bat off, bat off, and bat off, and you lose hope on getting the three loaves, and you're just happy to get the one loaf or a half loaf. But what I believe is that God's people ought to be on the offense. We ought to be offensive-minded. That we're, we're taking ground. We're gaining ground. We're just not coming in here to barely keep ourselves saved and to hang on to what a little bit of a, 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 a spirituality that we got or a breakthrough every now and then. We're just not. He wants you to just do that. He, but, but I think God wants us to take new ground. See, when we're in a defensive mode, we're just protecting what little bit we got. Let me say that again. I said, when we're in a defensive mode, we're just protecting what little bit of a breakthrough that we've got, what little bit of a blessing that we, we got, or, or we eked out because we did this, that, and the other. But God says, I want you to be on the offense. I want you to get the beating on the door. Go for those three loaves. Go for, go for it all. That's why we can't come in here and just go through the motions. I'm tired of a hot Sunday every now and then. I want a hot Sunday every weekend. Amen? You, we, we just can't come in here and just go through the motions. 
That's called religion. And I, I, I realize that there's some times that we're usually up more than others. I get all of that. I get a, but there's some times that you've got to have a conversation with yourself. If you knew the conversations that I had with myself standing over there saying, soul, soul, mind, will, and emotions, worship the Lord. My spirit wants to worship, but my soul man and body man don't want to worship. So soul man, mind, will, and emotions, you begin to worship. Then as I begin to worship, my body man has to follow because my spirit man wants to, and if I make my soul man get in line, then the body has to follow. So I stand over there and I say, worship, worship. Well, I'm not feeling it. Worship. I don't really care for that song. Worship. I don't like the style of music. Worship. Well, it's too loud. Worship. Worship. It's corporate worship. There's something about corporate worship. There's something about coming together. There's something about being together as a body. Something about that. There's strength in numbers. Worship. Beat on that door. Beat on that door. I'll be honest, sometimes there's, you can beat on that door and it opens real quick and you get what you need. Sometimes there's got to be that persistence, hammering and beating. I don't know why. Maybe sometimes God, maybe sometimes God wants to see how hungry we are. Because if we give our kids everything that they need just because they ask once, they're going to be spoiled brats. Amen? They're going to be spoiled. Even though you know you want to give it to them, you say, yeah, I, I just want to see. There's been times my boys come to me back when they was growing up, and, and I just wanted to see how badly they wanted something. How, how badly did they want to go do? You say, well, Pastor, that's awful. You make them beg. I didn't make them beg. I just wanted to see, I just wanted to see how badly they wanted it. How bad do you want that extra $10? Go out there and cut the grass. Go out there and rake the leaves. Go out there and redefine that, that, that edging around the mulch. Ah, oh, come on. They don't, you must not want it that bad. When you want something, you'll do anything. You'll be persistent at it. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People are looking for truth, they're looking for integrity, they're looking for honesty, and they're looking for purity in the house of the Lord. They're looking for that because there's none of that in the world. And people know how to come in, and they'll know whether you're faking it or not. They'll know whether you're, you're just kind of going through the motions yourself. They'll know that you may have a really a charismatic personality and you're a good orator and you can get up here and, and there can be no anointing and a guy can get up here or a woman can get up here and just begin to do this because they got charisma. I'm not talking about charisma. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and an anointing that supersedes charisma, supersedes looks, supersedes your talents and your abilities. Intercessory prayer is the secret weapon of the church. So if it's the secret weapon of the church, it's your secret weapon. Prayer. And I dare say there's a lot of people in the church today that don't pray. I said there's a lot of people in the church today that does not pray. How much are you praying? The only prayer do you get, does it only get when you come to church? Or when you think you're going to get a speeding ticket or you think maybe one of your kids is sick and you pray I'm not bashing on you I'm just I'm just challenging you how much do you pray because it's our weapon and, and Jesus said I'm going to even go so that one one can come that that will be better than me because he's going to be in you not just with you but in you and he's going to abide in you, and he's going to pray through you. And so God give us the secret weapon of our prayer language, our, our, our prayer language, our speaking in tongues, 
that, that comes up out of our spirit, man, that Satan does not have a clue what we're saying. We may not even have a clue what we're saying. We have an impression upon our spirit of how we're feeling or what we're needing to pray about, but the Holy Spirit prays through us, and Satan has no way of knowing what that is. It's called your prayer language. That's your secret weapon that God has given you to pray on things. Intercessory prayer is so important. See, your family and your friends can say, I don't want that stuff. You know, we, we, the modern church has moved past all that stuff. We don't need to have altar calls no more. We don't really need to lay hands on people anymore and anoint them. We just bless you and go on. And, you know, I, I, I disagree with that. I believe in prayer. I believe in laying on of hands. I believe in a, an anointing. I believe in giving people time and space to come and pray and, and be ministered to. Prayer, your prayer is like a guided missile of the Holy Spirit. The secret weapon of, it's the secret weapon of the believer. See, your family or your friends or whoever you're praying with may not come to church or may not want to be around you, but you can pray for them. And that prayer will go get in the car with them. That prayer will be in the bedroom with them. That prayer will go to work with them and work on them and begin to convict them and show them their need for, for a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, so if they don't want to listen to you, then you just go into your secret web and say, Buddy, I've got an arsenal that you don't even know anything about, and I'm going to begin to pray on you. I know when I was younger and I'd, I'd get out, I'd, you, know, I'd, you know, I didn't want to live. There was a time I didn't want to live for the Lord. Buddy, my mom prayed on me. I know my dad did, but my mom prayed on me. Whew. Everything I did went wrong. I got so miserable. I couldn't go have fun. When I would go to try to have fun with somebody or go to a party, hey, I would be a bummer at the party. It, it, you know, it'd almost be like, or, or, or your friends, they go, uh, what's wrong with you, Mullen? Is your parents praying for you again? Are you under conviction again? Get out of here. You're, you're killing our good time. See, because they knew my mom and dad were pastors, and they knew that, that, that we believed in living right, or they believed in living right, and I believed in living right, but I wasn't living right. You can pray conviction upon the ones that you love. See, if they come and want bread and we offer them something else, they'll go somewhere else. How many members? 9-11. 9-11 happened. It was horrific. It was awful. And there was a, a, an, an influx of people that came into the church because everybody was looking. How could this happen in America? How could this something to this magnitude happen? And people swelled in and filled up churches. But you know what happened? The church wasn't ready for them. The church only had one loaf. We didn't have three loaves. They came in looking. They came in wanting. They came in searching. And we didn't have what they needed. I'm, when I say we, I'm talking about the church, church corporately. And as, as fast and as easy as they came in searching, they flushed back out because there was nothing there for them we've got to be ready we've got to be prepared we've got to be on fire for God hallelujah hallelujah Kim you come and I'm gonna, I'm gonna close I ain't no ways near done I'm going to close with this. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, it talks about the bridegroom comes calling for his bride. But she is too comfortable to answer the door. The Bible says that the bridegroom knocks on the door and she says, I've already gone to bed. I've already washed my feet and done my hair and and I've settled in for the evening, and I can't come to the door. Now, this is in your Bible. This is representative of the church of Christ coming and knocking on, on your heart. 
knocking on the church's door and saying, I'm here. And the bride says, I've, I've already prepared myself. I'm done for the day. So as he tries to turn the doorknob and get in, he realizes he's not going to get in, so he leaves. But the bride begins to feel a little bit of remorse and thinking, well, maybe I need to get up and go and let, let the bridegroom in. I'm just paraphrasing this. And as she goes to let the bridegroom in, she opens the door, and he's gone. He's gone. He came, he knocked, he wanted to come in, but now he's gone. And the Bible says all there was left was just a, a scent of myrrh, or I'm going to call it a scent of his cologne on the doorknob. She missed the opportunity to, to have the bridegroom and entertain the bridegroom and, and have him come in. Then when she wanted to get up and go, he was gone. And all she was left was a fragrance of his past it's a picture of Jesus comes and knocks and says I want to come in into your heart and your life personally into a church corporately as a body but it's sad to say that there's a lot of times that we say I don't want to be bothered I've got my one two three we've got it all structured out we're doing Three songs, an offering, another praise song. We're going to have 30 minutes of word. We're going to bless the people. We're going to go. we got a time schedule. But I want in. And by the time that we get ready to let him in, we, all we have is something of the past. So I'm asking you, are you going to live with the past smell, the past experience, of a relationship that you once had, that you, that you once entertained the, bride, the, the bridegroom? Are you going to live on that? Is that going to be enough for you? Is just the smell of what he was or who he was going to be enough? Or are you ready for the bridegroom? Are you ready for three loaves? Are you willing to get up out of your comfort zone, push past what you haven't done in the past? Are you willing to allow the bridegroom to come in and take his rightful place? I'm telling you, as the church, in the last days, there's going to be some things required of us, some things that we got to push through. we gotta, we got to lose sight of, well, I had that experience many years ago, or they don't do church now like they don't do church now like they used to, like I like it. That's the smell of the past. Our relationship should always be current and fresh. Yeah, we may do some things, some different, but the word of God still stands and it's the truth. I for myself am not willing to just go off of a past smell of something that's happened in the past but I want something new and fresh I no longer can go off of one loaf but I want three loaves because I'm asking God to put into my pathway and place into my sphere of influence people that I can minister to that I can share the good news and I want to have something to give them. I don't want to go up to them and say, well, this is all I've got, one loaf. I don't want to go up to them and say, well, you know, back in the day we used to do church like this. Back in the day we used to have really Holy Ghost moves and, uh, and outpourings of, of the Spirit. We used to really have revivals. We used to have that, but it's not like, no, I, I, want, to, I want to be current and I want to be fresh. I want to open up and invite the bridegroom in every day. There's a knock on the door. Every time. I don't want him to have to beat the door down. I don't even want him to have to say my name. I just want to be able to sense in the spirit realm that the bridegroom is wanting to have a, 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 a time with me. 
a wooing with me. A time that I can get away and be private and, and the Holy Spirit can speak through him into me. I want to be prepared. I want to be ready. I want to be ready spiritually. And so I'm asking you as we stand. Are you a one loaf person? Are you a three loaf person? I want to ask Calvary as a church. Are we a one loaf church or are we a three loaf church? Are we going to operate off of something that we had in the past? Or are we going to go against go for something that's new and fresh? A new fresh anointing. See, it's easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to get the cares of this world. And it's easy for us to push out and push aside the presence of God. Doesn't mean that you're a sinner, but it means that the bridegroom is knocking. Are you ready to let him in? And are you ready to let him in to make the changes and bring to pass in your life what you want or what he wants for your life? Would you bow your heads? Father, Lord, I have delivered the word that you've given me. And God, I pray for each and every one here, Lord, that this has sparked or brought up something, God, that they realize that maybe they've let slip in their life. and Maybe they've just been coming to church and because that's all they know and just going through the motions. But God, there's so much more than just going through the motions. So much more of just coming out of duty and obligation that, Lord, we come in to, to be recharged and refreshed and renewed. So, Father, I pray right now for each and every one that's here that you would refresh, renew, re-energize with your power and your presence. And Lord, we no longer go for just what our daily bread is, but we go for beating on the door. We need more. We need more. We need more. We need three hot, fresh loaves because friends are coming, guests are coming, family's coming, co-workers are coming, people are coming. And God, we want to be ready as individuals and as a church corporately. So God, I pray that this word ministers to the hearts and lives of your people. And it will refresh them, recharge them, and challenge them to come closer, to be more aware of you spiritually in this last midnight hour that we're living in. And God, I give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.